All right, all right, we are back. We got our next guest strapped in. Sorry it took so long, but uh, hey, this is the High Tech Low Tech Studio coming to you live from an undisclosed location. There we are right there. My name is David, a.k.a. Christian, a.k.a. Kimba, alongside... Kimba Soup Carter. Yes, in the house tonight we have Dr. Ann Treasure, and uh, once again we have Julie. She has joined our team. She's going to be here more regularly, but she's joining in on this segment. There they are. Wave to the crowd. You guys are going out <laughs> straight on the internet all over the world. Uh, but real quick, we're going to do some quick demographics, and then we're going to jump right into it. Uh, this is the It's Your Perspective talk show. We are streaming live from the vi.com. Got to go to that website, click on Watch Us Live, and guess what? You will see us live. Uh, we are in a high-tech, low-tech studio coming to you from undisclosed location here on St. Croix Virgin Islands. No radio, no TV, internet only. That's the only way you're going to see this show right here. We have email, streaming live from the VI at yahoo.com. Uh, telephone number is 340-201-9005. You can telephone us or text us. We'll definitely get that uh, call. Uh, two Facebook pages, It's Your Perspective Talk Show, and streaming live from the vi.com. Give us a like, and guess what? Tweet with us. We're on Twitter. Our uh, Twitter account is VI Perspective. So as promised, we have uh, Dr. Ann Treasure in the house tonight. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. And uh, blessing us, uh, as we like to say, in-studio uh, appearance. Um, but, you know, we just wanted to invite, invite her on. I just wanted to get her perspective on... Uh, this whole kind of medical uh, industry, being a doctor, I guess being a doctor here, where did she go to school, and just a lot of other things. I think she, she has a, a lot to say in a sense. So uh, kind of introduce yourself, and uh, and you got to hold that microphone close. Go steal. You got to hold it up close. <laughs> you got to hold it up close to get the best sound. Uh, but this is Dr. Ann Treasure. A little closer. You got to closer to you, right? Yeah. You sure the mic is on? Yeah. Hit, turn, turn that mic on. Turn that mic on. Make sure it's up. Push it all the way up. Okay. Yes. There you all go. Right. There you go. So welcome to the studio. Welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, uh, you what know. Made, what made you choose this profession, man? Well, you know, when I was about six years old, it just reminds us how impressionable children are. There used to be a program called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And they would have sometimes guest artists. And one time they brought an artist who drew a picture of a baby in a womb. I think I absolutely lost my mind. And it's never been the same since. My mom had some uh, medical health encyclopedias. And I practically memorized them before I was eight years old. Especially okay. the sections about women and women's health. And, um, and, you know, and then the journey through school, everything that you do kind of comes back home to um, you know, all your science and math courses or, or even your, your own personal development. This really enhances who you are as you um, you go into your profession, which is a combination of both art as well as a science. And, uh, you know, here we are today. Right. Oh, okay. Nice. And earlier this week, we spoke about um, growing up and learning from encyclopedias. So here, we have another witness who actually, you know, learned from books itself. Because yes, we were talking about, you know, growing up and being all into the books, and this is how we learn. Right, and, and just the level of exposure. Once you're exposed to something, you don't know what will excite a child. Just something they see one day. Just, you know, whenever I'm doing sonograms in my office, I invite the children to look. Because I remember what that meant what to me, to you. even exactly. in, a still, right. in a still painting. What that would have meant to me, in, even in a sonogram. So you never know who you inspire. Exactly. So, um, schooling. Um, you did your basic schooling here on St. Croix. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost completely Virgin Islands educated. Um, nice. I had my entire uh, uh, primary and uh, secondary school, and I, I'm a graduate of the University of the Virgin Islands. Okay. And then, um, of course, we don't have a medical school here at that, at that time. We'll talk about that. <laughs> um, and I went to the University of Miami, where I did my um, medical school, and then I went to uh, Louisiana State University. Where I completed my residency in obstetrics and gynecology after an internship at Temple Hospital in Philadelphia. So, how was that journey? I mean, being it, in college, you coming from the islands. Tell us. No, like, it's a, it's a, lot a lot of great journey. We we really thought that we were as prepared as anyone else. We did never really felt that we were any different. In fact, we thought that we were at least as good as, if not better. Um, so, it, it's really important to instill a sense of pride and and not just a false sense of preparedness, but to be very confident that you can be successful and that those things are not out of your reach, those things were intended for you. So um, 
one of the things that um, that that helped, of course, is your parents inspire you and expect <laughs> high things from you. No, yes. it's really, really definitely, it, definitely, it, it's it really incredible, back. really yes. supportive, financially, physically, emotionally, all of that stuff. And then, of course, um, uh, one of the things that I'm grateful for is that I actually finished what we call a career degree. You know, I had done a, a bachelor's degree in biology at uh, the University of the Virgin Islands, but that it, today is tends not to be a terminal degree with which you can have employment. Right, right. So although you may be a very bright student, you may be a 4-0 in psychology from Harvard, it's difficult to get a job with a degree that's an ology. So the degrees that have um, technician or technology or have a licensure or a certification exam at the end, like nursing, you know, you become a registered nurse, or teaching or engineering, architecture, uh, accounting, all of those require certification, CPAs, licenses, yes. pharmacists. So if you mm -hmm. pick degrees that have a career somehow woven into the, the course of study, so in other words, a pharmacist instead of a chemistry major, you're more likely to have employment. So, but fortunately for me, that wasn't an issue. But because you do a second degree that's now has a career woven into it, it's easy not just to find personal satisfaction, but also career choices. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Now, people think it's 12 years and it's a long time, as if you're somehow in a jail sentence for 12 years. <laughs> but you actually live during that time. Everybody remember how fun college is? And medical school was like looking at the show, the show ER. Yes. It was like yes. it was like living ER every day. Okay. <laughs> it was actually one of the most exciting times of my life. I actually felt a little depressed after medical school because nothing would be as exciting as that as that journey. First journey, first getting into Absolutely. it. Absolutely, and, yes. and and you live. You have relationships. You have family. You have travel. So you're not in jail. You're still a person. So I can't do that for 12 years. Well, what else would you be doing? Having relationships, having family, having travel. Travels. So you're still alive Loud, during yes. those times in this really exciting uh, learning time of your life. And then, of course, um, uh, the residency. And residency today is a lot more humane than it used to be even in my time or the time before. They do allow you to go home and have even more family time. So How long, how long is a residency? Um? Most residencies are about four years. About four years. Some are three, like internal medicine or pediatrics. Um, and some are five or six or seven years, like neurosurgery. Okay. But on average, you expect to spend at least three or four years in residency. Okay. And you're actually salaried at the time. Okay. And, and so, really rewarding profession. It's one of the few professions that blends, like I mentioned before, science as well as the art. Hot, hot. hot. Yeah. What I really um, admire about Dr. Treasure here is the fact that she, I mean, she did her basic learning here in the Virgin Islands. She went away and she did not stay. She came back home she came back to home, give yeah. back to her community. And, and that was one of my and that things. That was very, very, um, I mean, I admire you and I applaud you for doing so because everybody, they stay and it's like, oh, this is alive. But to see somebody actually go away and they come back with so much to yeah, bring back yes. so much to their people, it means a lot. Well, so well, I'm a little embarrassed, but I do have to say it was not completely altruistic. Uh, there's some element of feeling like you can shine in a community where you need it. When I left Atlanta, there were 82 black female OBGYNs. When I came to St. Croix, I was the first one. See so you there? can actually carve out and create a program yes. in a place where you're needed. In other words, it's the big fish in the small pond yes. situation. Yes. But, it, it, but it even goes beyond that. Um, I had spent part of my, my training in Ghana. We're mm. in a very, very rural, remote area where they wash and rinse gloves, where they don't have enough paper, where patients sleep on the floor. Whoa, and okay. After that experience, you become so in tune what's necessary. I've seen people who walk four days to see you. Just to come to see you. Just to see I've seen you. those on all documentaries the food, yes. all the time. And, it's and after you live that, you're never the same. So the old, well, you know, beauty queen answer, I want to be a doctor to help people. <laughs> Once you live that experience, you really decide what's really important. And it was the only job that I've never gotten paid for, and it was the most rewarding. Doc, how long you stayed in Ghana for? You know, people. I, I always say that I used to live in Ghana, but I actually spent a month. A month. <laughs> but it was the longest month I of could my imagine, life. I yeah. could imagine. I could imagine. Yes. Yes. And how was, how was life over there? I mean... Well, as basic as you can get it. They picked me up in a, in a truck in Accra, as the capital city. And took 10 hours to drive 40 miles. And the guy had a whole bunch of big, like, logs, like plywood logs. And I was thinking, okay, they need supplies. And what the logs were for is when they'd get to places in the road that was so bad. Believe it or not, worse than St. Croix. 
and they would make the road drive to drive over, over it, take and then the put the logs and put yes, them back sir. inside the pickup truck. Yes, they're, they're doing that here now, too. <laughs> 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 I'm close to doing that for real, though. <laughs> I've had so many tire failures in the last month. It's yeah, really ridiculous. Yeah, 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 it's ridiculous. <laughs> so you really get a sense of really what's important, you know? Like, yeah. um, and I'm sure... I mean, being around a, a community and in the in such an environment that kind of like touch your heart and open your heart and you know. Oh, absolutely, the people exactly. are so grateful. They wanted to work with you. They were very patient. They would wait in line all day, and when it was five o'clock, whoever was not seen would just sit on the ground and wait till you came outside the next morning. Outside, without shelter. What made you What made you go to Ghana for uh, for a month, Doc? Well, it was available. It was an option for residents, and of course, I was what, the only resident my year. Only one from the Caribbean. Caribbean, right. Wanted to go to Ghana. I said, hey, it's my opportunity to go to Ghana okay. under the auspices of the university. Um, and in, in a unique setting. Like, I could always go to Ghana sometime in my life, but I would never necessarily get to go to Ghana as a physician. And I thought that that was an incredible opportunity to do international medicine and to get a sense of how things are done and, and, and how to do so much with so very little. And, and once you experience that, you're never really the same. So Got I think you. I'm better for having you. experienced that. How long have you been a doctor now, uh, Doc? Um, okay, my children, if you're listening, turn <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated from medical school in 92. So I guess it's 22 years, but 18 years since I completed since my com- obstetric specialty. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a so, long time. Um, I want to ask again. Go ahead. I mean, pregnancy rate and like dealing with mothers how was that like oh well compared it, to oh it, a, a world of difference one of the things is that where i was women didn't really have value so a woman only went to the hospital if her family thought she was worth going to the hospital and hmm. she had to get the permission from her husband or her male relatives to be treated so we saw a lot of maternal deaths in labor um uh, the World Health Organization, you know, that UNICEF mm-hmm. it actually works. We actually saw UNICEF people out there giving money and giving supplies and what have you. Um, but attitudes towards women, at, this is in the mid-90s now, really affected the, the, the level of health care. There was a lot of female, uh, what people call circumcision, but the more correct term, of course, is mutilation. Mutilation. So they would cut away what is the equivalent of the woman's penis or her sexual oh, enjoyment or removing her clitoris so that she would not be sexually promiscuous. Mm. So, you know, we saw things like that. Um, first wives were more important or favorite wives. So the, the, the value of a woman, I, I think to their detriment, not just to her detriment, but to the community detriment. I'm not sure if you're aware, but the, the, World, uh, the World Bank got a Nobel Prize for their macroeconomics policy, where they would give $500 loans to women. They gave like a million women $500. And what they did is they came back in a year to see what they had done. Some of them had bought a sewing machine, and when they came back a year later, they had five sewing machines and three assistants. And some were cooking, some were baking, some of them had sent their children to school. So you find that when you give women in these in these continents, in these communities, money, you you, you give money to a community. Community, yes. Fortunately, the guys still, we're still working on the guys. <laughs> you give a guy money, you give a guy money. <laughs> you give a woman money, you actually build the community economics. And the program was so successful, they actually won an economics prize, in uh, a Nobel, Nobel prize, prize in economics wow. for their work and for confirmation of something that we'd always been suspicious of. So um, it, 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 the, the continent has uh, a lot of potential. What I also saw too, even in terms of medicine, is that poor countries make their medical dollars stretch. So instead of spending $100,000 in US currency for a heart transplant, they vaccinate 2 million children so that they don't get polio and become deformed or die. So they use their resources differently Differently, it really and people shout marxism but they really put the most good for the for the most number of people and it it, it, for a poor country they really have to make choices that are meaningful to the most number of people especially when they're life and death choices doc when you came back here to to st croix to do your to start working as a doctor here in the virgin islands and you've been the first female overdue how was, the recep- how, how was the reception to you coming in? Well, you know, for the most part, the reception was incredible. 
there's no question here that, and, and everywhere, that people want qualified professionals. Right. In every area, not just in healthcare, but even within healthcare, they want physicians, they want nurses and pharmacists and allied health professionals that will take care of them. And that's so they can have choices and uh, good choices. The choice to take your, your healthcare dollar off island should be a choice. It shouldn't be a must. And it's important that we, by using our own healthcare resources, we, we in turn are investing in our healthcare infrastructure. So most of the doctors have their babies in St. Croix. Wow. They have the, yeah. You know, if we eat at our own restaurant. Yes, yes. And so it's really important that you, 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 you utilize your own facilities. Because if you think your facilities aren't great, and you take your money and spend it elsewhere, your facility will be less even. So the more you spend outside, the worse your own facilities become. It loses value. Yeah. Absolutely. Loses so it's value. really important that you invest your healthcare dollar into your own. Because here's the thing. The other places don't accept your indigent patients. So what, what's happened is that there's there's a skimming effect, <laughs> almost like a brain drain. There's right. a healthcare dollar drain. And so the exterior will become better the more you use it. The less you use it, the less sufficient, the, the, the less efficient it will become. So it's imperative that if we live on this island... We stay here and get our medical, all our medical needs here. We get all your medical, all your reasonable rural t level medical care. We will probably never do heart transplant because of the size of our community right. that you know usually your most tertiary things and that's what's appropriate should go off island even in the states that happens so small hospitals in the states don't do heart transplants but they should do your bread and butter stuff hysterectomies births appendectomies gallbladder surgery uh pneumonia care and of course and this is what's most important to your urgent accident, accident care. care right yes that okay so how is the state of the how is the state of the, the um our healthcare, in in general, in the territory right now. Well, we've been getting a blow for decades in that the, the territories are treated very unfairly with respect to the healthcare dollar. Right. The excuse that's given is that well, we don't pay federal taxes, so we don't get all the SSI or the equivalent Medicaid dollar historically. But what's really bothersome is that the territories don't get it, and the territories are not a majority population. So if you contrast the EU rules, the, the European Union, England initially was not allowed into the European Union because they had 14 colonies, only one colony of which had full British citizenship, which was the Falklands. Okay. The rest of the colonies don't look like England. So it, it's very disturbing that the, that the U.S. Virgin Islands, as a part of the U.S., or, or, or owned by the U.S., US. not part of the U.S., is a, the U.S. is a signatory to the, to the U.N.'s treaties on the treatment of colonies. And so you really should not treat and the we people are in your colonies because we differently. Are right. So we've suffered a blow with our Medicaid dollar in particular. So that's already a blow. The blow geographically and in terms of size-wise becomes a challenge for small communities to provide you know, all the services that someone might need. And then the latest blow, of course, is the Obamacare. So as the U.S. has taken a gigantic, a quantum leap forward in being able to provide what's close to universal health care, we've been left out of that, that benefit. Do you, so, you think that would have been helpful to get Obamacare here, in a sense? There is no question. Okay. Now, we've gotten most of the provisions, but we didn't get the essential part, which is the funding. You can wish for everything, but if you can't pay for it, it's just a wish. See, because what we keep, what, what I keep hearing that Obamacare is here, Obamacare is here, but just so we are not able to treat our elderly and our poor like like how we like well, basically we everybody can get free insurance bottom line well obamacare is not exactly free but for those people who have a challenge obamacare stateside provides some subsidies as necessary right. we don't get those same subsidies so although we have some of the provisions like your kids can stay on your policy till age 26 that's already here the free pap smears free mammograms free vaccinations Free preventive care, that's already here. Okay. You come to my office, you get a pap smear. There's nothing out of pocket if you have, you know, up-to-date up health insurance. Right. But do you have up-to-date health insurance? Yes. So for those who don't have it, the access to care is still limited. And, and, and then to pay for health insurance out of pocket, especially if you're a business person, if you mow a lawn or if you're a babysitter, how do you get access, access to, to care? care yeah. So, no, 
it's, it's, it's not quite where it And you need those dollars to, to keep your hospitals and your health care facilities robust and able to offer the services so that leaving the territory is a choice, not a, not a requirement. So, Doc, how do we get to that point where we can take care of everybody? We need to go to court. Okay. We need to go to the Supreme Court to say that this is unequal protection, unequal treatment. Under, under the same U.S. flag? Under the same U.S. flag. Okay. Yeah. There are a couple of parallel cases that are going on right now with respect to, to citizenship, and um, this is one. So any, someone has to have standing. So if you have insurance, you don't have standing. But if, you, but if you've applied for insurance under Obamacare and were denied, uh -huh. then you can make a case that the territory was not offered the, uh, the same option as U.S. citizen, who, by the way, pay the ultimate tax. But we pay the ultimate tax. We're eligible for the draft and are required to go to the draft. If, if, if my son can give his life for the U.S., yes, exactly. his mom should have access. Exactly. And he and himself a very good point. to, to health up. insurance. So, yep. so someone would have to take it to the Supreme Court so that if, the, if, if that's the way to right the wrong. So either through advocacy through Congress uh -huh. or through the Supreme Court. Now, I prefer the Supreme Court, so it's not at the whim of Congress. Yes. Yeah. Okay? So, so I guess Soup is going to be planning a trip really soon. Um, yeah, we, we have to advocate to <laughs> do it. Yeah, to, 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 um, advocate for our people here. Absolutely, and we're going to want attorney's fees too, so yeah, we can so. get a trip in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so t talk a little bit about... Um, you know, you're a doctor now, and, 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 and being a doctor, and, and uh, you know, just, just the work ethic that, that's involved in, in being a doctor, being successful at it. Well, it, well I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a physician, I'm a hospital employee, but I also have a private practice, so, wow. <laughs> so there's an incredible work, and, you know, your whole family is very aware of the sacrifices, and they share your sacrifices with you. But doctors are not in a vacuum, and if we don't have a clean operating room, can't do what we need to do. So the work ethic for the housekeeping staff, for nursing, pharmacy, for the people who work in registration, for the people who work in your office, your, your people who bill, who stock, nothing can work unless all those parts work along with it. And you know, I think the people here want to work. They want benefit, they want a good life, but they want to work. I think so too. It's just, it's just the opportunity is not there. The I, I get resumes. I get sometimes people just walk up and give me resumes. People here are hungry for employment. They're hungry for a career. They want a secure career where they can make a difference. Um, you okay? You need a break? Uh, I'm good. You're you good? good? Okay. Yeah. Um, so you, you have your practice now, and uh, I mean, that's going good. And uh, you also work at the hospital. I mean, how do you balance that with your family life? You know, and how, how do you how do you manage to balance all that kind of stuff? Okay, well, I married a really great guy, so that's that's oh, a big wow. part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Round of applause to the great guys out there. And, and he's well trained. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, I hope he's listening. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then also, um, you know, my parents. So you know, part of coming home to is well, your, your parents, parents who live design? here. Yes. Yeah, your okay. parents. Yeah, you have to kind of be here for your parents. You know, I keep telling my son. You better go to school because you need to take care of your mom when she's nursing home level. <laughs> so you really have to be, for the different cycles of life, it's good to have your parents. But my mom and my dad, you know, helped me out with my kids when they were, you know, in diapers. So, um, and my office staff takes care of me. So it's really a joint situation. But yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it is good, I mean, to be in a position like you and to have that good family support, especially coming from the person you're closest to, which is your husband. And most of the time, people don't realize how much of an impact that makes on someone's life. To have that positive, support. that drive, that support. support yeah. When you when you, this person feels like giving up, it's like, no, babe, you know, you, you keep on going, Absolutely. and you know. And is he so, a doctor too? No, he's not a, you know, he uh, started out in agronomy, and now he's an air conditioning contractor. So he's okay. not a doctor at all. Okay, so he's not, he's not getting in a crazy world like yourself. <laughs> Well, you know, it's a he lot of doctors you out. marry. He I mean, I, we yeah. know, we know that, but I mean, but he yeah. balances you out. Well he, well, he balances me out, not because he's not a doctor, but because we don't have the same personality. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> that's, listen, okay. I've yeah. heard that word balance in the last yeah. year, I have learned so much about <laughs> balance, okay? Because it is like you have to have that level. Somebody snatching Somebody you back the from the edge, you know, and then, yeah. are you pushing him out of oh, the chair? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
So what is like, I mean, when it comes to the community, how do you feel the community has supported you and your practice and, um, you know, patients? How is that going? Yeah, um, never had a problem. Uh, for the most part, pretty much smooth sailing. Um, uh, once in a while, we encounter a little physician jealousy. <laughs> oh, don't we? I mean. <laughs> the Senate. Okay. And there's always the, the malpractice lawyer lurking around the corner. <laughs> but actually, you know, we're not afraid of them. If you practice good, good medicine, medicine you know, yes, you don't have to worry about it. Yes. And in fact, I actually appreciate malpractice attorneys because they make sure that you're on your Keep you on your toes, yeah. And that you take care of people well and in a safe way. So, so they need to be there for those people who have been harmed. Um, but for the most part, I... I very happy to be here. The Virgin Islands has huge challenges, not just healthcare challenges. Um, that, that we have the potential to to be a very incredible um, community. Get the you know the right leadership and 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 if the community steers itself towards those things that will drive the economy, that drive you know people want good schools, they want safe places, good roads. They just, they, they, whether you live in Utah, Basic Atlanta, they want the same of things. Life. Yeah. So how long have you been doing your own practice now? Since 99. Okay, okay. Talk a little bit about, you know, starting your own practice. Wow, you know, it's a, really, a learning experience. And I think that's for any businessman because that's the business end. Um, we learn from our peers, from the people who are already in practice. You make a couple of mistakes. Maybe even lose a little bit of money. It's easier now because of the information highway. Right. How to start a practice. You know, you see it everywhere. You know, you okay. get books. Uh, you also, you start small. You start with a one-room facility and maybe one or two employees and usually build on it. And, and you change the times. You, you get software to do your medical records and, and to, do your bill, you, to do your billing. So you actually grow, you know, as long as you're open to going to courses, seminars, and looking towards your, your seniors, your, your senior peers who already have established practices. And I'm, I'm sure they do that in every industry. Right. So new young attorneys will ask an older attorney, an established attorney well how this and how do you set up and what do I need to do you know and, and just to be open to to learning where's your practice at on uh, doc in in barren spot my barren spot oh okay yeah. that's in my backyard <laughs> so um let's say if there were like young ladies or even young guys who like they're interested in doing what you're doing does your practice do you allow to have like we talked about internship mm -hmm. earlier this week for younger for children in the community who wants to you know part like right. Usually, we when you visit a, a, a very narrow specialty and just in an outpatient setting, it's usually called an externship. The internship is a, what, usually the term that's more used for someone who's in their training, which is usually a one-year process through a university program, like what's called a recognized specialty training that's recognized by the American for. Medical College okay. Association for what they call residency training. So those usually, within those, you may have periods of time that you spend like I spent a two-week externship doing um, I don't know if you've ever watched CSI doing autopsies so yeah so yes yeah. so many people in different settings oh yeah. <laughs> them can tell you yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes I spend eight hours in the autopsy room yeah, yeah. The, the one month I spent in Ghana was technically an externship so it's not the it's just a small part of your training but it's not the broader part of your training and, you know, they have internships and externships for just about every profession. So architects have to go on-site, hands-on, um, sometimes pharmacists. You know, there's a portion of their training that's clinical, that they have to do rotations, they have to work within a hospital. So there are many teachers, nurses, all of those have to do um, on-the-job parts of training. Okay. Yes. Doc, on average, how many patients do you see a day? Um, it varies. Sometimes I spend you know, a whole day with one sick patient or two, one or two deliveries or surgeries. And then sometimes when I'm doing a whole bunch of pap smears or prenatal exams, I'll see sometimes about 18 or 20 patients. On average, about 12 patients a day. Okay. Wow. wow yeah. that's, uh, that's moving there. And you're the only doctor, or, you, or did you share that? Uh well, I've shared a space with several physicians. In fact, all the doctors are in practice now. We've shared space at one time or the other. Dr. Michelle Berkeley, Dr. Ronald Anders. Um, who delivered my kid and uh, uh, Dr. Warren Briscoe. Okay. So we're all fairly collegiate. We share call and we take care of patients who have, are not registered or not assigned a physician coming on to the hospital on an emergency basis. Okay. Okay. 
All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, this is the It's Your Perspective Talk Show. Our guest tonight is Dr. Ann Treasure, and we have Julie in the studio as well. Uh, thanks for coming by. Uh, we'll be right, right back. Stand by. All right, all right, we are back. This is the It's Your Perspective Talk Show. It's about 9.42 p.m. on Thursday, August 21st. 
Uh, this is the It's Your Perspective Talk Show. My name is David, a.k.a. Kimba, a.k.a. Christian Longside. Kimba Soup Carter. Yeah, that's it right there, man. In studio tonight, we have Dr. Ann Treasure. And uh, our new new addition to our talk show, Julie, is in the studio with us tonight. Yes, Thank sir. you. <laughs> and uh, we're just going to kind of move on here a little bit. We're going to talk. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Ebola, the Ebola virus. And just sort of taking over Africa, so taking over Africa, by Western nation in Africa right now. So, and uh, these doctors, I guess, that came back to uh, Emory University in, in Atlanta and and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, if you could just shed a little light on, you and know, then too, you know what's so funny for me? I mean, well, I, I kind of, you know, because I look at everything. The disease this is started in Africa, and then these two Americans they come back to Atlanta, and where Atlanta is at, and where Emory is at. Is in a black populous part of the country too also yeah so it's kind of like okay questionable for me you know it put a it put a question mark in my head you know where they're going with it so that can you uh, um elaborate on what caused ebola and where ebola comes from and you gotta got turn your mic on your mic Named after the the Ebola River that's in the West Af- in West Africa, um, so it became associated with because that's where the with first region cases were was identified. That? Okay. Um, I don't know specifically. But all I can say is West Africa. West Africa. Pretty much where it is right okay. now. Okay. Okay. And um, it's transmitted by bodily fluids. This this is what we know, um, and we know f- that there's a couple of strains, sometimes related strains. And we saw the first blips of it in the 80s. And we saw another peak again towards the late 90s. So this is more of an Ebola resurgence. Um, I think what, what some of the, the, what I hear you kind of saying is that you feel a little suspicious about a couple of things. Um, how is it moving? Why don't we have a vaccine yet? And somehow the, the Western kind of... Uh, tra- trying to not be interested and exactly now some some countries have had some terrible history and we know everything from slavery to the other stuff yes but we also know of more more recent history things like the tuskegee study yes and how people get left out of treatment purposely and even people even start to wonder did they infect anybody purposely purposely yes or is right. bioterrorism gone wrong Mad. Or, or gone correct <laughs> okay. According to their plan, right. So, okay. but but let's talk again about just virology, right? In general, um, you know, we, we're afraid of lions and tigers and sharks, but really, mosquitoes, specifically because they they're small enough to carry viruses and carry it effectively, are the most dangerous animal. And it was recognized thousands and thousands of years ago, first in Africa, I, um, ironically, that when children got, like for example, chickenpox. If you were to scrape the skin of the unaffected children, or the, sh- the I'm sorry, scrape the skin of the children who were affected, uh-huh. and to cook the pus and scratch the other children, they would either get a very mild form of the sickness or just become immune. So the concept of immunity was first identified on that continent mm. thousands of years ago, so that even in the days of slavery, those slaves who had those techniques Could have been were highly re- revered because they protected their their. The investment of a plantation yes. owner so they had not only discovered the science of immunity but it also um of, of vaccination so the fact that the the, the body can naturally learn to recognize nice. a viral or bacterial predator and then to form immunity and so that you can actually manipulate kill or weaken a strain so that you can then confer immunity and prevent death or disfigurement um I, you know we it becomes remote because we don't remember anybody getting polio. But if you were to Google polio, I'm not telling you to leave the stream, but you would, and click on images, you'll see how devastating these things are. So people say, ah, you know, don't have to vaccinate because they don't remember what it was like when people weren't vaccinated. So there's no question that we've mastered the science of being able to immunize. So why haven't we done this for Ebola when it showed its head exactly. in the 80s? 80s. And is it because... The Western countries were not affected by it. Ah, it's not important. It, those people get it. So we. So we the question, the, the best question is, why haven't we been on the, the, the something that's so devastating? It, you know, ninety percent chance of uh, uh, seventy nine percent chance of death. Why haven't we had a vaccine before? 
And why have we not strengthened the medical infrastructure of our former colonies in Africa? They once had cut all of Africa up. They've, they've almost uncivilized Africa in some, in some instances. So that when you have intact healthcare structures, it's hard for those things to spread. When you have intact schools, and, and uh, where people learn about how to care for Femstem. the sick and how to yep. prevent illness. Yes. That that's how you prevent illness from spreading. A is by education and B is by intact healthcare facilities. So it almost seems as if somehow it's, 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 they're derelict because the, the West has ignored and turned their back on Africa. So at the very least, passively, they're somehow complicit in why Ebola is actually a problem now. And suddenly, we're interested in Ebola because two Westerners now have it. So the, the West doesn't have a good track record. But the reality is Ebola is a problem. And if it takes two Westerners getting it to now work at it because now they're afraid it comes into that it, it comes, comes and home. because when planes fly, it used to be that I don't know if you remember, um, the word quarantine comes from the Latin quarenta, which means forty. You would put somebody in a room for forty days until whatever they had was gone. Yeah. In fact, sh- when ships came, that's what the harbor masters are for. Not just to guide a ship. But the harbor master used to go out to see who on the ship was sick. And they had to look at everybody on the ship to see if they could come into port. So the, the idea of quarantine and whatnot used to be more effective when you just had ships. Now that we have planes, planes. and our borders are so porous, it's hard to control. It's better to actually just immunize people and try to prevent them from moving around because it's hard to prevent people from moving. So um, it really requires... a, a, a an international effort. I remember now that the U.S. and the Soviets and the Chinese were enemies in the 50s. But under the table, they had to cooperate about smallpox. So these were countries who were building nuclear weapons against each other. They cooperated and eradicated smallpox from the face of the earth. So if you were born after 1972, you did not even get a smallpox vaccination. Smallpox is gone. Except for maybe in a lab just to, you know, smallpox is gone. And that took country cooperation. So although we try to kill each other, we won't try to kill each other with viruses. viruses. Because if I make a virus against you and send it to your country, next week it will be in my country. Exactly. So we know that bioterrorism is not going to go the route of using viruses to infect people. In fact, that's why they use anthrax. If you notice, they're always trying to talk about weaponizing anthrax. So weaponize anthrax. It's because anthrax cannot be transmitted from person to person. person to person. You have to give them the dust. Exactly. So if you're caring for an anthrax person, you can't get the anthrax. So um, I think they're on this, the page now, if, if, if even if for the wrong reason. Right. Yeah. Trying to look for a not just a cure. The cure is already too late in some cases. But actually prevention. Meaning that we start with immunization and developing vaccines. But also we strengthen education and healthcare system and even security if you if the healthcare workers are afraid of guns and and um you know uh boko haram the, the nurses are going to run away run away they that's won't right have an intact healthcare that's right. healthcare organization so it's really important that they allow for education healthcare and and nation and border security to make sure that these viruses stop where they are and right now, right now they're barricading the people I'm now in Liberia. 50,000 people. 50,000 people. No, it's very ticklish because you don't want them to feel like prisoners. You want them to feel like you've, in a sense, rescued them. You're, you're, you're protecting them and protecting the rest of your nation. So it's important that those people feel free within those communities to free, uh, that they have access free to movement. free movement, that they can communicate, okay. you give them free phones, you give them satellite. Everybody want a cell phone? We'll tell you leave. We'll make sure you can call your relatives. Mm. We're gonna make sure that you got food, you got water, well, that you have electricity, that you have every creature yeah. comfort, so you don't feel imprisoned and, and 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 somehow trapped in a negative way. I want to ask you a question. Um, you mentioned mosquitoes, and I know from time to time here we have this uh, these different epidemics of mosquitoes. Um, they, 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 what, there's a thing called the chikungunya. And all that, I mean, and so you said that mosquitoes are sort of the, the primary... Uh, it's the most dangerous animal on Earth. Yeah. Um, they kill 13 million people every year. 13. 13 million. Not sharks. Mosquitoes. Keto. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And a part of it in the Caribbean is because we like to have a bucket of water. Just sit there. Just sit water. Water. Yeah, yeah. Because we're so, remember, you know, before flush toilet, remember that? <laughs> and, and we always think it's not going to rain or we have our crotons to water, water yes. fruit trees and we always have 
flowers plants on the porch because that's what we do culturally or we have tires in the yard because somehow we're gonna patch that tire one day one day we'll work. <laughs> All the potholes in the road. And yes. the potholes in the road. <laughs> but you see, but here's the thing. You only need a half inch of still water to grow mosquito to larvae. It, to make it larva come so in. So you're if you're if even if you're doing the right thing, if your neighbor has flower pots on the porch, you got to shake the bottom out every once in a while so you change the, the dog, you know, we also have the pan of water for the dog. Yes. You have to turn, turn that it out over. Yes. yes. So that you, you get rid of the mosquitoes because the mosquitoes at your neighbor's house will cause you to get infected with chicken gunya. And chicken gunya is not as fatal as dengue. Right. But chicken gunya hurts more than dengue. Okay, the symptoms and just beer. They used severe. to call it break bone syndrome because you feel like somebody broke all of your bones. Wow, you wow. Know? It's one of those diseases that people actually even sometimes ask to be killed. So chicken gunya is devastating. And skin so soft and citronella don't work. California baby doesn't work. You have to use DEET. So you have to use permethrin to spray your clothes or your mosquito nets, or you have to actually use DEET like family. And you can actually put DEET on children as young as six months old. Okay, okay, okay. Julie, you got to hold your chicken mic up. Chicken Gunya. We have Chicken yeah. Gunya. I believe we have about 40 cases. 40 cases, but... On St. Croix. 250 in St. Thomas and about four cases in St. Currently Johnson right Fire. now? Yes. Currently. Whoa. So what are yes. the symptoms? Well, the symptoms are a very, very, very high fever. Um, uh, and you may have ill family members and you may start to have body aches. But you don't have the typical runny nose that you associate with, with, the, flu, the, with the flu. So with why would you just have this extremely high fever? Now, a lot of people think, well, I have dengue already or chikungunya. Why wear repellent? It's more important for the person in the house who has a regular dengue or chikungunya dengue to use a repellent because mosquitoes will bite this infected person and, and then travel. It travel to the yes. other members of the household. Yes. So especially when you have somebody in the household who has dengue or is even suspected to have dengue or chikungunya, that the family members wear repellent. And, and you, she said there's 40 cases, so I mean, are these people just in the hospital or they're just, uh, they're sure, just taking them? Many of them are in the community. Just um, taking a medication? Well, there's no medication. There's no medication for that? No okay. Medication. There's no cure. There's no, and there's no uh, vaccine right now. Okay. Um, 40 known cases. What we do know is that typically in most countries, for every one case that presents because the symptoms are intolerable or because that person has access to health care, there are 10 persons or nine more persons who are not identified. So we usually make a, a, mm. a calculation yeah. based on the known cases. Okay. How long, how long has this disease been around? Um, I think it reared its head some years ago and it's somehow in a resurgence mode. Went back. So it's in yeah. the kind of, kind of like the Ebola like came Ebola. up. Yeah. Nobody never did anything. It just went away because well, and no it vaccine was no ever. No vaccine, but it doesn't, doesn't kill you. Okay. So Ebola is still the critical, the crit right, the critical yes. area. And of course, the regular old dengue. Okay. 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 The dengue will kill you. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about um, prenatal care. I guess is that, uh, you know, um, I guess that's some of the services that you offer, I guess. When right. Um, obstetricians and, in, and some family practitioners who do obstetrics and nurse practitioners and midwives do offer prenatal care. And it's really exciting. Like now I had mentioned that certain things are free. Um, under the new regulations for people who have insurance and there's greater access to, to Medicare, Medicaid qualification, even if you are not pregnant or don't have children, you have access. But for, cer for certainly there's a presumption of eligibility if you're pregnant. So prenatal care is one of our strong areas. Okay. Now, what is a problem on the island is chlamydia. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted infection. You can't tell the other person has it. In fact, the best looking people have the most because we want to get beside like them. them. Whoa. So Whoa. The chlamydia now, what's Whoa. awful about chlamydia is that it can cause you to be sterile, infertile, unable to have children. Children, it can yeah. cause tubal disease. And for pregnant ladies, it's one of the things that we test with prenatal care. It can cause your water bag to break prematurely and cause you to have a million dollar premature baby with lifelong difficulties or even just miscarriages. Mm. So it's really imperative. We have, you know, we alternate from year to year between having the first and the second most highest prevalence of chlamydia under the U.S. flag. What? So, wow. so it means that we have thousand? four times, yes, our per capita in the rate, Virgin Islands. the Virgin Islands, wow. it's in always in that top number of, of uh, per capita chlamydia. 
So okay. is, is this is this a cleanse? Is, is this because I'm not being clean or just being it's with sexually sexual? transmitted? So but to being with sexual different partners, at, different partners at the same time. Yes. Okay. We have monogamy issues here, but it's also screening because other communities are not monogamous, but they but they come for screening. Now it's kind of hard to get the fellas, and I don't know what the magic word is to get a fella to show his BP <laughs> and to get tested. Okay. <laughs> Or what we have is resistance to medication. So we have a, a, a you know, we test the, the girl. And by the way, chlamydia f- screening is also now free. And so you have chlamydia and he needs treatment. He says, well, I don't have it. But so she gets that her. resistance. But he's been with her. Yeah, but I don't have any symptoms. Hmm. I'm clean. You know, yeah. it, and it's kind of, we have the attitude at all the ages is that, you know, I ask people like, well, you know, ma'am, I'm just diagnosing with diabetes. Which one of your parents had it? None of them. You know. <laughs> Either because Whoa. culturally we don't tell, tell yes. never tell your children what you have, and also because a, a dude in the Caribbean, if he not if he doesn't feel any pain, he's in good health. He's in good health, yeah. Until somebody tests him, usually forcibly, they tell him that you have diabetes, you don't have it. So many times I say, have you been tested and found to be negative? No. Has, is your father diabetic? No. Well, has he been tested and found to be negative? No. So we don't know. And so many of us die from the silent killer. Every time you open your obituary and you see a guy who's 58 and never got a chance to get Social Security, many times it's because they were unscreened or untreated. So we take an attitude that until you have something, you have nothing. Hmm. And so it's really imperative that we take a better approach, especially for the dudes, to get the guys out to get screened. Yeah. Everything from chlamydia to the silent killer, high blood, blood pressure, pressure and diabetes. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little about, about um, HIV and AIDS and that kind of stuff? Um, well, well, we have a certain population. Many of them were the former drug users, but also their partners. So we have a very high per capita um, incidence of AIDS. A lot of people who have lived abroad will sometimes come home because, you know, resources get strained when you have HIV. So we have a very high incidence of HIV, which is a little concerning because if we're getting a lot of chlamydia, the transmission routes... Or the same. the same as it's HIV. The same. It's the same. So, so we really need to have very open conversations with our children exactly. about sexuality and about sex. Yeah. We, we tend to be say one thing forward, and then we live a different lifestyle. And so we just need to be very honest about urges. But the hormones of a 20-year-old girl are double the hormones of a woman who's 40. So we see that, especially for the youth. The judgment and the experience is, and, the, and the stability is not there, but the feelings are just... Yeah, Woo! Woo! yeah. O- o- off the <laughs> meter. Yeah. Yes. They're off the meter, yeah. And oftentimes, I really don't believe it's you would get a, uh, an STD because, okay, you're here sleeping around with Tom, Dick, and Harry or Susie May. Sometimes it could be that you're with this one partner and you're, you're giving yourself to this one person, partner. but then... Who's this person giving themselves to, to coming home with that's you know? Right. So that's, that's it's true. not always there are some some people who like you know I've had some friends and they come to me with like you know Julie I found out that I am I have this or you know I'm like but Julie I I I wasn't sleeping around or I wasn't doing this and okay but then you don't know who that person, person was with yeah was trust with, was yeah with and what that person yeah, had, yeah. trust with. factor so, trust so, yeah are, are there other programs for the. Uh, the HIV, I mean, if you have it and you live here, I mean, are there yeah, programs? Yeah, we, we, we do qualify for the Ryan White program. So, okay. So that's the federal funding for AIDS medication and the care of persons living with HIV. Okay. So we, that we do have, and of course, through Medicaid, and many of them happen to be on Medicaid, that they, that they can get taken care of. But I'm not worried about them. They already have it. I'm worried about people who have not yet caught it. Okay. How can we prevent? There's no question that if we how can we prevent the spread? I even have very frank conversations with young girls. Buy your own condoms. Well, he didn't bring any. Well, you have to buy your own. Yes, you yes. And, and if he brought any, did he bring one that was in his friend's glove compartment of his car Sitting for, for, for six two months years? Or yeah, like it's gonna crack. Yeah. You know that feeling? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you have to be a little more proactive, uh, uh, you know, about. Even your choice of a family, you know, when and with whom to have a to have a child. Yeah. That's, that's a long, that's a forever. Oh, I don't want to marry him, but why would you ever want to have a child with him? Yeah. So we have to really have, start having real discussions about. 
but some of our choices. So is the information getting disseminated on the public and and, and a regular? It's there. I We're giving it out. It's there. I think the best place to um have like discussions and to to introduce those kind of um, information would be in schools. Absolutely. In yeah. schools. In the it's junior the high school. Oh. In a junior high school. Exactly. Okay. That's where the proliferation. I could remember yeah. this one time when I was in junior high school. Um, this group of individuals came and they talked about STDs and mind you right that day I went home and it just opened and I was so thankful for that because it, it was so interesting to see that was the first time hearing that X, Y, and Z was around us and this was this was what going on. Yeah. It's like I was very thankful for it and then some, some time ago I asked a friend of mine who has a daughter who's in junior high I was like um you know, did they ever, like, being in junior high school, have you ever had any sessions where people come and talk to you? Because I wanted to know, because right. I know what it did for me yes. that day when I went home. I was on Google. I was like, no, I need to see what these things look like, <laughs> you know, so right. it was very helpful. So, like I say, in school, like, especially junior high school, like the doctor said, would be the best. The start. The, the start. The, start. Yeah. the best starting yeah. place, start. yeah. Exactly. So, Doc, you, you talk about preventive care. I mean, is, is the preventive care component of the health uh structure here is it is it does it need help or does it need more work or is it, is it pretty adequate uh yes and no we've we've improved um particularly the Fredericksted health center has really been a maven at making sure that they get access for dental care people don't notice but even dental care affects your general health because gum disease will spread to your heart valves yes so I did, um I didn't know that, huge yeah. So they've, you know, put dentistry, they've put a satellite clinics, clinics in the in the schools. Um, there's now an uh, East End uh, location. They have a sliding scale. They do outreach, do information. So I think we've come a long way as far as educating the public and making care friendly so that you don't have a sense that when you come that they're angry. Or you come for, yeah, right, right. it's 3 o'clock, you know. <laughs> they're really trying to yeah, take care think, of you. I think Fredericksburg Clinic, they've extended some of their hours. Like on Wednesdays, they close they're at 7 and yeah. 9. Yeah. There's and some they Saturdays. They come out here yeah. to Princess too to pull out next branch. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Princess. Right. And, and they want you to bring your family. So there's re they're really trying to go through women. Because women are the, 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 the barometer for the health care. They're the ones who bring the kids for the most part. I mean, there's some... You know, their husbands like mine, but there's some men don't. Yes. But so you, they want you to bring the children in. Bring your parents in. That's the latest pitch. Bring your parents to the doctor. Bring your spouse to the doctor. Bring your children to the doctor. Um, and so which they're, they're really trying to do outreach. So there's, there's room to go, especially if we, we get more funding. But the, the framework exists. And I'm, I'm really proud of the, the leaps and bounds that we've made um, Roads aren't so hard, but the we're, we're trying with <laughs> yes, the yes, system. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> a bumpy, a bumpy ride to your to your yeah. doctor's office. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what do you think uh, when you look at the bigger picture? Um, wh where are we falling short, maybe in a sense, with healthcare here? I mean, that where's the areas that we need to sort of improvements? Access and and coverage. There's no question that we need more access and more coverage. Um, that actually would solve. You do about 70% of our woes because the hospital, for example, takes care of a huge amount of indigent patients. Yes. And you're paying for those. Cleveland Clinic, oh, it's beautiful, yes, because they don't see indigent patients. You have to have money to go to Cleveland Clinic. So one of the things is that the, the government, which is probably the biggest employer right now, should probably give some incentive for you to use the local facilities, like reduce deductibles and co-pays if you spend that money locally. Not only does it make it a better healthcare facility, but it makes it funds your healthcare industry. If you're losing, and this was not your 2000 figures, $100 million a year in hard money, and I say hard money, in actual claims, not the hotels and the flights and the yeah. rental cars, but if you put that money back into your economy, oh my God, because when you work, doctors pay gross receipts, receipts. Yes. hire more people. Yes. Yeah. You know, another economy. specialist on island there is a healthcare economy that we have not tapped into and we're probably going to have a huge deficit in our budget overall because of the Diageo deal and that disaster that, that was and because we lost Hovensa we could at least try to make that up from different sources but in particular the from the healthcare industry okay. that we just lose a hundred plus million dollars a year go. in hard money 
out of the territory. Okay. We can you use have that. thought about running for Senate? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be the most boring job. <laughs> oh my hot. 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 <laughs> Oh, but it's important that all of us have relationships with senators. And Definitely. Because then we get to share our views Active, and give them right. side Give them legislation, know? communicate with them so they know what, what the, the need, the health care needs are legislatively of the territory. Okay, okay. Um, what, what, what do you think about, um, you know, like getting more doctors here? I mean, you know, we, we interviewed a lot of the candidates that were running. and they, Right, yeah. They the one thing is you have to not have professional jealousy. You have to be doctor friendly. We were very friendly to EDC companies. We want them here. We wind them and dine them. We really have to take the same attitude towards physicians, right. towards any professionals that are a source of revenue or maintaining revenue within your territory. Um, so that's one. Like I'm glad when there's another doctor who makes more money than me. I'm gl- I'm happy. I want everybody to do well. I don't have that professional jealousy. We as, as senators, as a governor, as as a delegate. And the, the locals, we need to want other people to come here and do, do well. Do good, exactly. 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 Okay? And to, to spread the breaks around. So if there's a tax break, I mean, there's no, I don't know if there's, a, there's no tax break for doctors that I know of. But if there's a tax break going around for EDC companies, maybe you want to do it for a small Business. outpatient, yeah. you know, yes. doctor's office. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm not trying to put a plug for myself. Maybe it's for architects. Or maybe it's for you know uh, IT startup companies. Make that reasonable. Share that. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I think the EDC program is actually a decent program, especially if you ha- you put in place, you know, all the things to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do. You know, the enforcement is there. If you can take that same attitude towards any any industry that either keeps money in the territory, people forget they always talk about bringing money in. But also, about who keeps, keeps money, money or here. turns money to the territory? Yeah. So but doctors are all right. They just have to have a good and make sure that legislatively that we're not somehow singled together. out. Yes. As somehow. Yeah. You, you mustn't do well. You mentioned this word. I guess it was professional jealousy. Yes. So what? I mean, what is that more specifically? <laughs> is like doctors it. hating on one another? <laughs> no, like senators hating on doctors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We want. We want to pay taxes and contribute to the community the better we do the better the government does okay okay the better the hospital does if you bring a neonatologist here and he's doing well it means that the hospital is getting his services you're keeping babies on islands you're making it pleasant for families you already have a preemie it's the traumatic that they don't have to fly and uproot their home system nice. they don't they don't have to, to spend money in the hotel they actually stay right here on island and the money stays here stays in our hospital and then tomorrow the hospital uses that money to buy a new piece of equipment okay or to pay a raise to a nurse okay yes okay those dollars will just multiply within our community yeah if you don't have perf- jealousy towards the neonatologist the hospital and the community will do better okay okay uh, our guest tonight is uh, Dr. Ann Treasure. You you okay? You hanging in there? You can go a little longer. I'm good. You're good. Okay, man. Um, um, talk. I, I don't know if you you might have touched on this a little bit, but talk about you know uh, a friend of mine, a friend of ours. Uh, I don't mention her name, but her daughter just uh, she's in Miami now, dropping her daughter off. She's d- starting college, but ultimately she wants to be a doctor. Okay. So what 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 could you uh, what could you share as okay. this young lady is starting her journey to become a, a become a doctor right now people change your mind along the way and sometimes you go in and realize that maybe a course is tough or it's not exactly what you want or you don't want to study that long what I would recommend is that every step of the way that you get a career degree so when I was in medical school I trained with some nurses who already kind of had an idea what was going on and they had a career already so if you were to change your mind and you did a biology degree you, you don't have to get stuck you are a nurse, you're a pharmacist. So we had pharmacists who came to medical school. We had, um, I guess, maybe some forensic technicians like yourself, um, <laughs> biomedical engineers, so that you do a career degree on your path. Because some people get, say for example, I had done a nursing degree. I maybe changed my mind and said, well, you know what? I'd like to do midwifery. I'd like to be an advanced practice nurse. And then as an advanced practice nurse, I can open my own practice. I can become a nurse anesthetist. You know, some of them even make more money than doctors or have better lifestyles than doctors in some cases. Less liability, what have you. Or, or less years of training and that may work for you. 
Um, but definitely what your friend wants to tell her kid is to make sure that's what she wants, keep her options open, and make sure that she does something that's broad enough for different options. So that she stops at some point along the way, she can right, still have right. a career. Career, career yeah. Not just a degree that says yeah. ology. Yeah, okay? I got you. A friend of mine told me her kid was going into, wanted to be a forensic anthropologist. And so should she get an anthropology degree? I said, absolutely not. She should become a forensic technician. It's, listen, we cut right now. A forensic technology degree. And then she can do a specialty in anthropology. Right, but the, okay. I, the difference is one is an area of study and one is a career. Career, okay, I got okay? you. Um, dental hygiene. There's, there's some there's some associate's degrees that put you into a, a income and, 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 and job opportunities that are incredible. We were looking for a dental hygienist and they were offering around 70000 for an associate's degree dental hygienist. Whoa, okay. So there's no question that the medical fields and, and the allied medical fields do, do very well. Um, so on your way to becoming a dentist for example if you did a bachelor's degree program in dental hygiene you a have a bachelor's degree program and you have a career so if you decide not to go on to dental school or just this suppose you don't get in you still have a career, career. you have a career yeah a so 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 i'm i'm you know in the 80s it was okay to do an english degree but if you want to be an english teacher you have to do a de- secondary ed- english education, education. yes yeah. Okay. Not the English degree because yes. you have to be a certified. Right. You have to take a licensure um, test to become a teacher. So keep career degrees in mind and just go for it. Okay. Okay. Hopefully uh, she's here. I see her on uh, on Facebook. Hopefully she's watching the show, passing the information on to her daughter there in Miami. Yeah. She'll be back, I guess, next week. I guess after she drops her off and all that stuff. Um, well, it's about ten ten fifteen. I don't know if if uh, you guys are uh, done. Um, or you know, is there anything that uh, you want to you know plug, uh, doctor? Any 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 your, any your websites? Uh, any uh, anything like that? Uh, I think I have a Facebook page. Oh. <laughs> <Somewhere>. <laughs> <laughs> and treasure. And then I think I have a, 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 a page on my site. One of the interesting things that I plugged on my uh, my my medical Facebook page is we're trying to get people to have better options for spacing their children. So whereas people would have either no option to have more children or closer than they wanted to and then feel like they had to resort to permanent tubal ligation, um, which many people have come to regret, the the whole industry is trying to steer patients towards what we call long-acting reversible contraception. So that means the intrauterine device. And there's some very safe devices, some three-year, some five-year ones with hormones you may know as Mirena or the Skyla, which is my preferred, uh, one of the newer ones, which is a a smaller device and less hormone that that, that lasts a a shorter time, so that people can space their children without the hormones of birth control pills. And not not birth control pills are not bad, but they're not for everyone. So that people have different options for, for, you know, spacing children without doing something that's permanent and that, that they may come to regret. Is that, is that something that you want to talk about real quick is this whole thing of birth control? I mean, huh? the, the do's and don'ts and what's good and what's not. Uh, you, you know, you want to share anything on that? Yeah, like I said, well, that's the newest thing is that IUDs are becoming more readily available and paid for and readily available on island. Um, you, you know, tubal ligation is permanent. I've seen a lot of regret. And... Uh, the guys seem to have a bit of re- too. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so people need choices for for very reliable contraception. They don't want a failure, but they don't necessarily want something permanent. So we have those good options. And birth control is actually very good. It prevents certain kinds of cancers, cancers of the womb, cancer of the ovary, um, or, or reduces your risk um, and regulates the cycle. Lighter periods, less anemia. Is this is um, steroids involved in a birth control? Well, there's some sex hormones in the birth control hormones, and you can get ones that mimic what they call are bioidentical to human hormones. Right. And are at the very lowest tolerable level so that the side effect profile is either good or actually beneficial. So for people with irregular periods, sometimes those bioidentical hormones actually will regulate them and actually provide some health benefits. Gotcha. So we have people who are not sexually active or who have tied their tubes who we've put on the pill. What's really exciting also is the vaccine against cervical cancer that now is available for, for both, birth, birth both control. Well, not as birth control, but 
They've given it now to boys and girls about age anywhere from age 11, or actually from age 9, but ideally at age 11. Uh -huh. But if you get them before they're exposed to sex, even forcibly exposed to sex, that we can actually do away with cervical cancer. The future hmm. for breast cancer is not chemo. It's using your own immune system, system to fight it, to learn and to make antibodies. So the science of immunity that was discovered in Africa so many centuries ago, so many millennia ago, oh, go, yes. is the it's way to go for almost everything. Okay. So the Gardasil vaccine is, is, and it's free at the provider's office. All, all vaccinations. So what age? 11 years old for all boys and girls. Okay. Yeah. And you just mentioned another topic too. Uh, I guess we could talk to, uh, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and any, any, uh, any, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how is the VI uh, dealing with that? Well, a good question. You know, it's hard for us to exactly quantify our cancer statistics because so much of our cancer care is done off island, and it's hard to do the reporting to Department of Health, and you want to make sure whoever wins. The Department of Health has a robust <laughs> reporting um, infrastructure for for disease, and so we can actually get some a handle on some numbers. But we, there's no question that nationwide and even locally, that for women, breast cancer is the most common cancer, and for women who don't smoke, actually the second most common is colorectal cancer. Okay. For men, it's prostate and second colon. So colon is the most common because it's both men and women, women. but for breast and, and uh, prostate, prostate are the most common cancers okay. of men and women. Okay. And it, it's devastating. Get a mammogram. Mammograms are now free too if you have health insurance. In oh fact, really? the Wang Louis Hospital <laughs> okay. has a women's center that has free mammograms. Wow. Free, tell a friend. Okay. <laughs> tell a friend. Yeah. Tell a friend. Tell a friend. Tell a friend. Any, any other programs that, that I guess you, this is free, right? I mean, as long as you have insurance? No, the, the, right now the Wang Louis Hospital, at least until further notice, is doing free mammograms regardless Period. of ability to Okay. Do. And okay. it's a beautiful woman's center. If you've seen it, it's actually gorgeous. It's oh, really? Art. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. I would like to thank uh, the guys and I would like to thank you so much for coming today because honestly, I was quiet most of the time because this was such like I was learning so much I was like wow I'm just taking in information yeah so yeah. I'm so grateful because I have learned a lot and I'm sure the viewers have learned a lot also the guys definitely. right yes definitely yes. so yes. we really De appreciate it and I'm so glad that you're receptive and that you, you you're listening um, uh, of course this is that this time is like no other we're really on the crossroads where we could actually take the wrong road or the good road to improving not just our healthcare system in the island um, and our access and even the, the education of healthcare, but just the whole economy in general. So it, it, it's a great opportunity to talk about what's dear to me and what's important to all of us. So, okay. Good show, David. Thank all you. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely want you to come back. Uh, I was going to say where her um, office is. Anybody oh. who's interested, because definitely after tonight, I, I think I'm going to be making an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm located in Barron Spot, the Barron Spot Village Mall. Okay, yeah. okay. Everybody knows where and that in the is. the yellow pages and white pages. Okay, okay. Well, our guest tonight is Dr. Ann Treasure. We want to thank you for coming out to the High Tech, Low Tech studio and, and just kind of blessing us with some medical uh, knowledge as it pertains to the VI and some of the benefits and some of the programs that are out there. Um, yeah, thank you. And we definitely want you to come back. Keep doing uh, it. Sooner than later. Yeah, to uh, somewhere in St. Croix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere in St. Croix. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This is the high tech, low tech studio. We're at an undisclosed location here in St. Croix, Virgin <laughs> Islands. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is David, a.k.a. Kimba, a.k.a. Christian Longside. Kimba Sukata. And Longside. Julie. Julie is here. Yes. And our guest tonight Very is Dr. Like Ann Treasure. <laughs> I want to say thank you. Uh, it's about 10.22 uh, p.m. Uh, Good night, everyone. We will be back on Tuesday, next week Tuesday for sure, 8 p.m. with Remem some more fun stuff. Remember, um, a storm or depression, something is coming in. So yeah, be prepared, stock up on your batteries, your waters, your medication for the old and the young. Um, keep your important documents in a safe um, baggy Ziploc. And just be safe. Be you know? safe. Be safe. Be safe. Be yes. safe. All right, until uh, next week, Tuesday. One uh, perfect love. One perfect love. Thank you, Dr. Antreza, Julie. Thank you, Anne. Thank you very much. And uh, we will, uh, we're going to sign off. Good night. Good night. <laughs>